Hello everyone, welcome back to History Collector's Forum. I'm with Stan, and he has a unique collection in front of us. So Stan, what do you have for today? I have my accidental collection of OSS weapons, handguns, and ones that might have been used by them, and ones that are documented to have been used by them. When I was in high school, I bought a paperback for 60 cents called The Spies and Stratagems by Dr. Stanley Lovell. And in it, he talked about his work in the OSS. And he mentioned only two guns. One was the silent M3 grease gun. And the other was the silent high standard. And, you know, here I am about 12 or 13 years old going, got to get them. Well, I never did. And for good reason. One, they're very, very expensive. Two, in New Jersey, the silencers are verboten for everybody. So over here, before you decide to call the ATF hotline and just think you're going to get a reward, this is an airsoft. Closest I'll get to a silent M3 grease gun. And the high standard... This is a fake Maxim silencer that I attach with a cleaning rod, just for just demonstration purposes. I found the OSS just fascinating. And I kept reading books, buying books, going to the library, everything I could. And I got a few of them here. I got a lot more at home. And it was just, but I never thought I could get an OSS gun. I mean, that's, come on, you know, they're not going to be out there. And what I'm going to talk about in this presentation is they're out there. And you're going to be uh, treasure hunting because I found them by accident in many cases. In some cases, a little extra effort on my part. But they're out there. Now, why are they out there? I have no idea. Because I thought they would never leave, you know, the Office of Strategic Services. And when they closed down, they sent their stuff to military intelligence, naval intelligence, and so forth. And then, of course, along came the CIA, so don't know, okay? In 1970, I was stationed in Texas, and I was an assistant company armorer sometimes. And we had this book here, the field manual, called Pistols and Revolvers. Well, the only revolver that they showed us in the book, and the only revolver we had was a Colt Detective Special, as you can see, <coughs> with a square frame. But the ones we had had rounded frames. All right? But they showed the square frame Colt Detective Special as an issue U.S. Army revolver. So when I was in a gun shop, pawn shop, I believe it was the town of Belton, Texas, this gun was on the wall. And I'm looking at it, and I'm going, that's like the one in the manual. And it's gray finished. It's parkerized. That gun is probably U.S. Army. So I asked the guy, got to take a look at it. He gave it to me. And on the bottom, I went crazy. Can you make it out there? R.A.P.? Wait. Yeah, R.A.P. That stands for Raritan Arsenal which was like 35 minutes away from my home of record in New Jersey. So here was a gun that had been parkerized, maybe reconditioned, at the armory, which closed in 1964. So here it is six years later, and I have a New Jersey repaired Colt Detective Special. Damn it, it must be U.S. Army issue, and I'm going to have it. So I purchased it. And I, at that time, being in a Spec 4 enlisted man, I had to store it in the arms room. Being the consistent company armor, that was no big thing. I don't know how many people offered to buy it from me. Everybody wanted it. So when I went home for Christmas leave, it went with me. And I had it for a good number of years. When I joined the police force, I carried an official police on duty. And I carry this off duty because, you know, it's a Colt, it's a Colt, the grip, everything else. It's beautiful. Many years after I left the department, I decided to splurge. And I went and got a Colt letter. And here it is. And to my amazement, I had stumbled on to a gun that had been sent to the Office of Strategic Services. 
All right. The Fowler Building, Rosalyn, Virginia. For those of you who live in that area, the Fowler Building no longer exists. I believe they built a hotel on the location. But here I was, a member, you know, I was now possessing an OSS gun. Probably the only one that I will ever, ever have. I was convinced of that. So what happened? Well, in 1983, I got chosen to be on the staff of the 1st U.S. Army Area Intelligence School, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. And while there, I met a lot of interesting people. I consider it one of the high points of my career. And we got changed to the 2nd U.S. Army Area Intelligence School when the Army reorganized, as you can see by my shirt. And my new commander was a guy named Colonel Braverman. And he was a full colonel, commander of a strat mid. That means strategic military intelligent detachment. And he was out of New York City. Now, his specialty and his team specialty was the Balkans. In other words, there were these strat mids all over the country that specialized in an area like Central America or Africa. His was the Balkans. If the United States was to deploy for any reason into the Balkans, the strat mid would be immediately activated and sent to give, shall we say, subject matter expertise to the commanders. So he invited me to join the Military Intelligence Reserve Society of New York, which I did. And we would meet at Governor's Island, which at that time was a Coast Guard facility. So my wife and I would drive from New Jersey, go to Governor's Island, go on the little ferry they had, and go into the Coast Guard officer's um, building or club and have a fantastic dinner and always a guest speaker. And Colonel Braverman had contacts like crazy. We had one speaker was from the New York City Police, Red Squad, <laughs> the Red Squad. Um, they were organized to go find communists back in 1920. All right. And they were still looking for subversives. But the most interesting people that I met were OSS agents. There were a lot of them around in the 1980s, still alive. Some of them were from Camp Ritchie. Most of them were Jewish, born in Germany, had come to the United States and decided to go back and fight Hitler. And it was just fascinating meeting these people. If you go to Governor's Island, there's supposed to be a plaque dedicated to the Military Intelligence Reserve Society. People don't realize during the Cold War, there was a continual battle between us and, and the Soviets in the New York area. And we had counterintelligence agents give us a phone number that if we saw any car with diplomatic plates, we were to call right away and tell them what the car looked like, the plate number, and where, the, where we had seen it. We also, some of the people were given code words to throw into their phone conversation. You're looking at a big deal. Okay, we're used to thinking of phones, everything by wire. No, everything sent by radio waves. So let's say I was told to use Operation Overlord. So I'd be talking to my brother, my sister, or some family member, and I'd say, Operation Overlord. Guess what? The Soviet signal service operating in New York would lock, lock onto my channel, my phone, and waste their time for the next two, day, two weeks or so listening to my conversation because I had said some magic word that they were looking for. So it was a cat and mouse game going on in the New York area. Now, the pistol most associated with the OSS is right here, and that's the Liberator, or FP-45, Flare Pistol 45. Now... It was actually designed by the Army. The Army wanted it for guerrilla warfare. And then they decided they didn't really need it. So the OSS took them over. And then they sent them out and found out, well, General MacArthur didn't think they were worth shit in the Pacific Theater. The SOE didn't think they were worth anything to use in Europe. A million were made. We know that at least a half million were dumped in the ocean. How many survived? Don't know. Okay? They're a unique item. Now, why weren't they used? Well, you see, in Asia, the Dutch, the French, the British, who were fighting the master race in Europe, 
had plans to be the master race in Asia when they returned and the Japanese were thrown out who thought they were the master race in Asia. All right? And they really didn't want people running around with guns because they were going to reestablish their colonial uh, empire. So the guns didn't really get much use. All right? The use was China and the Philippines. Why the Philippines? Because America wasn't worried about reestablishing colonialism. We had promised the Filipinos back in 1936 that July 4th, 1946, sayonara, we're leaving. It's not our thing. We're not going to. So where are these liberators? Good point. I met some guys at Fort Bragg. One guy told me, oh, yeah, my father was in the OS. Says I got two of them home still in the original wax covered box but he never delivered them showed them to me or whatever so i didn't luck out in getting one in the box but uh the liberator is an interesting thing there's a lot of uh, youtube videos on it forgotten weapons and others uh it was the original ghost gun no serial number no rifling good for maybe 50 shots before it came apart which was an idea that if you sent them to asia they would rust away and people wouldn't be able to uh, do nasty things to the returning colonial powers. Okay. But that's the Liberator and it'll always be associated with the OSS. Well, I now had a Liberator and I had a Detective Special and a gun shop near me offered me this gun with a Colt letter telling me that it too was an OSS gun. So that was a time where I actually purchased a gun knowing <coughs> that it was an OSS gun. All right. But I'm going to end up with two more OSS guns. Yeah, you take a, you know, pull it out. It's blued finish. Real nice. They, a lot of them were sent to Europe uh, because the SOE and others liked them. The team that assassinated Hangman Heydrich, uh, they carried Colt. Their guns are in a crypt in a museum in, in the Czech Republic. Uh, it was a very popular gun for the British to use. And you'll get some of those guns will come back and they'll have British export markings saying not English made and so forth. I ran into one, but I didn't have the money on the time, and I had to pass it up. But this one here is your your OSS Colt 1903. Now, if you run into a Colt 1903, you got to ask yourself, do I feel lucky? Okay, here is another Colt United States property marked. Okay. This is Parkerized. This one's about 10,000 serial number over this OSS gun, all right? And it's Parkerized and marked U.S. property. And the later models, they put a rear sight that was more like the one from a 1911A1, and they put, I think it's 19 serrations rather than 17, same as a 1911A1. And here's a book that I strongly recommend if you run into one of these guns, John Brewer. Uh, in the back, he lists thousands of these guns and where they went, to what, uh, what general, okay? To what, um, and this one here, unfortunately, there's like 10 guns with the serial number before it that, are, that were given to generals, and there's like 10 more right after it, but there's a blank for this serial number. So I have no idea. It probably went to Springfield Armory, to be issued to general officers, all right? Um, could it be an OSS gun? Yeah. How would I find out? Colt letter. Am I ready to spend that kind of money? No, but maybe someday I will. But the Brewer book, fantastic. Also, Bruner, sorry, this is the best book. If you're really into OSS weapons, this is the book to get. A lot of stuff you'll you and I will never get our hands on it. You know, it's just, that's the reality. But yeah, the OSS weapons, Office of Strategic Services. Yeah. All 
1994. Mm -hmm. And you can see the table of contents, so forth. Oops. Yeah. Illustrations. Fantastic book. Strongly recommend it if you're into OSS stuff, right? Like I am. All right. Now, the gun shop in New Jersey, in Rahway, um, had one of these blued guns sitting there, straight frame, blued, beautiful. I said, you know what? I like the gun so much, I, I can't shoot this one anymore. This is a safe queen. This is an OSS gun. So, I bought it. <coughs> then I decided to send it away for a letter. Guess what? It's an OSS gun. It was in the same shipment as this one. But never got reworked, parkerized. So now I had two detective specials with OSS provenance. A couple years later, same gun shop, they have another one. And they got it listed as um, made in the 1940s. And I'm going, if it's made in the 1940s, it probably went to the U.S. government. So I bought it, went for a Colt letter. Guess what? It's an OSS gun. It was shipped on a different date in these two, but the same order. So I've got three detective specials. And if you are a collector and you run into a square grip, the Colt Detective Special made in 1940s, it's probably worth investing a Colt letter. You might find it being sent to military intelligence. Yeah, that, that's a distinct possibility. All right. But again, it's treasure hunting. You might strike gold and you might get fool's gold. Now over here is a Colt Commando. Um, serial number is 1,096, I think it is. And I found out that a thousand of these were sent to the OSS very early. So I said, hmm, this one might be in the serial number range. So I went and got a Colt letter. You win some, you lose some. <laughs> this went to a factory in Newark, Westinghouse. Now, I have seen Colt letters for co Colt commandos, and they're also shipped to uh, United States Government, Property Officer, Supply Division, Office of Strategic Services, Fowler Building, Roslyn, Virginia. So you have a Colt commando. If it's marked on the back, Boeing factory or something like that, I wouldn't recommend uh, getting a Colt letter because you already know who it belonged to. All right? Now, in training people, what, you know, um, this is a very interesting book, too, I recommend anybody get, How to Be a Spy. And it's the World War II SOE training manual. Um, there's a couple copies of it out there. What I want you to understand is we were, we were neophytes in the spy business. So what we had to do was send our people to the British camp, Camp X, which was in Canada. This is the training syllabus for what they were teaching spies. It became the basis of America's spy school at Camp Ritchie in Maryland. And one of the things that I found interesting, there's a section here on small arms, and it mentions that they, you can practice with a high standard pistol. Now the high standard um, the silent model didn't come out till much later, but this is before America entered the war, but the British were using high standards for training. Now, demonstrating, loading, unloading, target shooting, position, all this other stuff. And they tended to use the Colt 1903s, all right? Now that particular gun, you look on the top of the barrel, see if you say property United States? That one, those were made for the United States government. All I know about that one is, according to Sp Springfield Research, was that it was assigned to a minesweeper. Why? I have no idea. But it's a high standard USA model, made for the U.S. government during World War II. They, of course, had the special one made later on with the silencer, integral silencer. Uh, I'd love to have one. And it used special 22 long rifle ammunition. What was the special ammunition? Full metal jacket. No, full metal jacket. 
Right, because somebody decided that if we're going to shoot Nazis, we got to use ammunition that doesn't violate the Hague Convention. Now, nobody makes Full Metal Jacket 22. Now, if you're a survivalist waiting for Red Dawn and all you have is a 1022, those lead bullets are going to make you a war criminal. You think somebody in the ammunition business would, to help out the low cost, Patriot, we're, we're, you know, dreaming of Red Dawn to make a 22 long rifle, full metal jacket ammunition. All right. Now, what about the U.S. spies? What were they trained on? To a great extent, the 45 automatic. Our guys were trained on the 45. Now, that's a service ace. That gun there is, is basically a 22 trainer, but it's full size. Did they use it? I can't get documentation. Did they use the high standard plane model? I really don't know, but the 45 was the gun that you were going to use. Now, when I was at Fort Bragg again on the staff, they had a reunion of the Detachment 101. Detachment 101 OSS was the group that was sent into Burma to work with the Kachin tribe against the Japanese. And one of the guys on our staff had a PhD in history. And he got to interview like 13 or 14 of them. And if anybody's doing work on Detachment 101, uh, the JFK Library probably has copies of the, of the interview. I have copies of the interview because I was able to make copies. And I put them on VHS and later on on DVD. But interesting people. Now, <coughs> war story. Very important than what a might have been, right? Over here is how 45 automatics came out of the factory for the, during the war. This one happens to be a Remington, okay? You see the box, nice quality box, okay? And inside, of course, was a pistol with an extra magazine and New Jersey pistol purses permit. And I threw a cleaning rod in, but this is the way they left the factory, okay? Now, during World War II in January, okay, OSS was working in um, Indochina, French Indochina. And there were various groups there that were helping us rescue downed American flyers who were dropping bombs on Japan and having to bail out over French Indochina. And leading one of the groups was a man who had spent time in the United States. He had washed dishes in a New York City hotel. Uh, he spoke some English. He studied American history, was very impressed with the Declaration of Independence and other things. When the war ended, he went to France to try to plead the case for his people with Woodrow Wilson, who wanted self-determination. <coughs> Woodrow Wilson was a racist. He wanted self-determination for the Polish, the Czechs, the Slovaks, white Europeans. He was not interested in self-determination for people in India, Africa, or Asia. So the guy was kind of disappointed, and he turned to Marxism on the grounds that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So he was leading a group in French Indochina. Now, what happened was, he got very, very sick, and the OSS called in a special medical team, and they saved his life. And he was very, very appreciative. And they were very appreciative because he was rescuing American pilots. And he made a little request. He said, can I have a dozen or so 45 automatics in the box? In the box, brand new. Sure. Now, when they left the factory, they were in the box. When they got to an air op operational area where you're doing gorillas like Philippines, or they would be taken out. They were lightly oiled. <coughs> they would be smeared with some cosmoline, stuck in a 55-gallon drum, one on top of the other, a bunch of magazines, and then airdropped to resistance groups. So when they got them, they were in these drums, banged about inside the drum, cosmoline. All right, he wanted brand new in the box. It, it's just a request. They provided him with 45 automatics. He then held a meeting among a different various groups and basically said I work with the Americans the Americans like me and they work with me 
Here, each one of you chiefs here, here is proof. Here is a pistol, brand new. And this man then became the leader of the resistance movement. His name, Ho Chi Minh. And when he writes the Declaration of Independence for Vietnam, he copies it, a lot of it from our Declaration of Independence. So America had an opportunity right after World War II to be friends with Ho Chi Minh, but because our NATO requirements and our interests in Europe were greater, we decided to be friends with the French instead. And Ho Chi Minh ended up being an enemy. So the OSS, <coughs> fascinating stories. My recommendation to you is if you see any Colt Detective Specials with a square frame and they were made during World War II, get a Colt letter. If you can run into an OSS fam veteran's family, because I don't think there's anybody alive. Guys who served in 1945 in the OSS are probably not around anymore. But if you can find a member of the family, they might have brought back something, who knows. Um, like I said, I stumbled onto it. Uh, I admire the OSS. Glad that I have met real people from there. And like I said, as I explained to you, I lucked out and got some guns that are associated with the Office of Strategic Services. I hope you like our presentations. I hope you check like and I hope you check subscribe so History Collectors Forum can continue to educate and illuminate. Thank you. All right, until next time, thanks for watching.